Amen. Stand with me if you would. Turn to page number 58. And can it be page number 58? Hope you got a good nap this afternoon, ready for a great surf. The kids are singing tonight. We're excited about that. Page number 58. On the first verse. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me? expression ever made of love was when Christ died for us. On the second, he left his father's throne above so free so song page number 64 is a song that may not be quite as familiar to some i don't know if we've ever sang it here together but i do know it let's see if we can sing this together page number 64 feel me now here we go hover o'er me holy spirit bathe my trembling heart and brow How many of you have never heard that song before? All right, fairly new to us. You did well. Let's try the second verse. Here we go. Thou canst fill me, gracious spirit, though I cannot tell thee how, but I need thee greatly, need thee come. Oh, come and fill me now. Fill me with thy hand. 
brow Thou art comforting and saving Thou art sweetly filling now Fill me now, fill me now Jesus, come and fill me now Fill me with Thy hallowed presence Come, oh come The kids are getting ready to sing here um, just a little bit. When they get up here to sing, listen to the words of the song that they're getting ready to sing. The song is called In the Shadow of the Cross. Near the cross I stand, troubled heart and trembling hands. Knowing all that I have done, do I dare to even come. Near the cross I fall, no more strength to even crawl. Still my faith is undeserved, knowing I do not deserve to be near the cross at all. Verse 2 is, near the cross I pray, draw me nearer every day. Bring his fame before my eyes, may I not forget the price. Near the cross I bleed, no more fighting I conceive. Though my heart is full of fear, bringing all I hold dear, lay it down and set it free. In the shadow of the cross, humbly I surrender all. Lord, may I, nev may I ever be lost in the shadow of the cross. Sometimes you may hear me pray, Lord, hide me behind the cross so that you may be seen. That's kind of where this thought came from, from this song. But uh, boy, just to be under the shadow of the cross and to be there and to see our need, our greatest need. Number one, our greatest need has been met. Amen. Greatest need for man was salvation. And it was met there at the cross. And, uh, and we still need to go to it, though. Humble ourselves, right? How do we think about that? We think about dying to the flesh. We think of the cross. Everything's got to lead to the cross. And uh, we're going to hear about that. The kids are ready to sing. They said that they were ready to sing, except for three of them. So I won't point out who they are. But uh, anyway, glad you're here today. Thank you for being here uh, tonight. Um, we are excited about what God did this morning in our service. We had... Carter getting baptized and uh, did a good job there. Proud of him. And uh, we're just excited about the, what the Lord's going to do tonight. Amen. Amen. And uh, see, Brother Walker, could you lift your voice and uh, pray and open up our service tonight? Amen. Let's sing. Page 538. Jesus is all the world to me. Page 538. On the first. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my hope. He is my strength.
could I this friend deny when he so true to me? Following him, I know I'm right. He watches o'er me day and night. Following him by day says all the world to me I want no better friend I trust him now I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end beautiful life with such a friend beautiful life that has no more humor for you today. Tim Bryan is really getting into these. So here we go. What do you call two monkeys who share an Amazon account? Prime mates. <laughs> it's actually pretty good. But What's blue and not very heavy? Light blue, of course. I wish my kids weren't offended by my frozen jokes. They really need to let it go. Why does Waldo wear a striped shirt? Because he doesn't want to be spotted. What kind of doctor is Dr. Pepper? A physician. That's it. We're done. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> glad you are here today. We did have some guests with us today. I'm not seeing anybody here tonight that's visiting with us. It looks like we're just home folk around here tonight. But thank you for being faithful to church. Are you all ready to shake hands? No? Who's not ready to shake hands? No? Why not? Are you a sourpuss? Huh? Are you a bump on a log? No? Are you grumbly? Are you bahumbug? Huh? Anyway. All right, well, let's shake hands and greet one another.
grab your songbook, page 188. Page 188, Jesus will outshine them all. Page 188, oh, what glory awaits me. Oh, what glory awaits me in heaven's bright city. When I get there, such sights I'll behold. A million scenes of rare beauty will demand that I view them. Still, Jesus will outshine them all. Mansions will glisten on the hills of glory. Happy reunions on streets of gold. Angel choir singing glad praises forever. But Jesus, he'll Sparkling river is flowing, happy faces are glowing, land of splendor where night never falls. The golden glass gives reflection to the city's perfection, so Jesus will outshine them all. Mansions will glisten on the hill. One more. This is this is from our dear Miss Sandy Foster. Yeah, you got you, you got them all getting involved here. Don't don't let them don't let them fool you by their innocent look. I know I shouldn't have done this, but I am 83 years old, and I was at the McDonald's drive-through this morning, and the young lady behind me leaned over and on, leaned on her horn and started mouthing something because I was taking too long to place my order. So when I got to the first window, I paid for her order along with mine, my own. The cashier must have told her what I'd done because as we moved up, she leaned out her window and waved to me and mouthed, thank you, obviously embarrassed that I had paid, repaid her rudeness with kindness. When I got to the second window, I showed them both receipts and took her food too. <laughs> now she has to go back to the end of the, the line and start all over again. Don't blow your horn at old people. They have been around a long time. <laughs> That was pretty good. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. Well, time to take our tithes and offerings. Let's be faithful. Uh, God has been faithful to us and uh, has given us uh, abundantly. And so uh, praise the Lord that we get to give back to him. Brother Steve, can you pray for the offering tonight? Yes, uh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here tonight. We still rejoice in the Lord over the one that was saved yesterday and the one baptized today. Help us, Lord, to clear our minds for the message and open our hearts. See how we can use this message for the upcoming week, Lord, and see if we can uh, get someone else to come to your kingdom, Lord, and mm. come to your church. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us, and thank you for the faithful people of this church. Keep our missionaries on the field. Keep the lights of uh, this church going. Keep our vision going, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.
the cross I stand Troubled heart and trembling hands Knowing all that I have done Do I dare to even come Near the cross I That was precious, wasn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, children. Well, I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 3. I try to keep the Lord's Supper fresh, not same mundane thing over and over again. Um, I want us to remember it, but never want to be rote about it. That's one of the reasons I don't do it every week. Or I'm not saying that that's wrong. It does say as often as you do it. But I think if you do it every week or probably even every month, it just kind of becomes rote. And uh, so we just try to do it when the Lord leads. And usually well, once a quarter I like to do it and just remember. And Sometimes I'll do it at the beginning. Sometimes I'll do it at the end. Sometimes I'll tie in a message. Sometimes the message will have nothing to do with it. 
But tonight's one of those that have everything to do with it. We see in Philippians, uh, the author, of course, is Paul. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he begins in verse number 7 with some just marvelous words. I'll read them as you follow along. The Bible says, but what things were in chapter 3 of Philippians, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to talk to you tonight about examination time. As we begin to take the Lord's Supper here in just a few minutes, Paul admonishes us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to let a man examine himself before he partakes. And so we're going to look at a few things here as we examine ourselves to find out where we are in the shadow of the cross. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you tonight for this message you've laid on my heart. I pray, Lord, that we would be drawn closer to you in our relationship. I pray that we'd be stirred, knowing where we are, knowing where we could be, knowing where we should be as it comes to serving you and, and, uh, and drawing others near the cross. And Lord, uh, thank you for what you have done in my life. Thank you for drawing me to the cross for salvation. And... Lord, even to the cross, when I have to die to things that I'm allowing in my life that aren't pleasing to you, that may be hindering my relationship with you, I pray tonight that we would be reminded of these things. We sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do now. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul was writing here in this chapter what he once deemed important. If we look in verse number 5, he thought these things used to be important to him. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said those things used to be something that I was striving for. But you know, God placed me on the examination table, Paul says in verse number 7. And here's what I think about those things now. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Amen? What was deemed important now is a de desire intensely to have a relationship. What changed? The examination table. God's examination table. Now this is exactly what God means or once, rather, for us to do when we come to the Lord's Supper table. We are told, again, as I said a while ago, to examine ourselves. 1 Corinthians 11. It is a time to lay ourselves upon God's examination table and begin to see what needs to be done to what? To remember Him more. To live for Him more. To be more like Christ. And when we take a good look back at Calvary tonight, this is what we're doing with the elements here, his blood, the symbol of his blood and his broken body. We should begin to see what needs to be changed. What needs to be removed tonight? What needs to be replaced? What needs to be repaired? What needs to be restored? What needs to be rekindled? Many songs were written about Calvary's examination. William Newell's hymn, At Calvary, what an examination table experience he had. When he wrote, years I spent and vanity and pride. Caring not, my Lord was crucified. I didn't, I didn't care. I, I couldn't care less about it. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. And then in verse number two, he says, after I was examined, 
By God's word, at last my sin I learned, right? Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Isaac Watts would go on and place himself on the Lord's examination table, and he would write, When I survey the wondrous cross, I think he's saying this this morning, on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain, just like Paul said, I count but loss, and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I uh, sacrifice them through his blood. The last verse he writes, The love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Watts would write later in another song, At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. But drops of grief can ne'er repay that debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do at Calvary. Those beloved hymns and more all draw us back to Calvary. Why? For an examination time. To see where we are with our relationship with Christ. Let me ask you tonight, where are you? Where are you in Christ? Can I say sadly, some of us Christians in the world today, they only wear the title. And if you saw their lifestyle, you would say, where is that title even seen? Is it hid underneath your chest and your vest or somewhere in your pocket? Because you definitely don't show it anywhere. You say, well, that's judgmental. Well, not when it's very obvious that you're not living for him. Let us begin to examine ourselves tonight in these four areas. You ready? Have you taken time to examine your salvation? Look at verse number eight. He says, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the, what's the next word there? Knowledge, Knowledge of Christ. Verse number 10 says that I may know him. Do you know him? Or do you just know of him? Or do you just know about him? Does he know you? <laughs> Examine that tonight. You say, well, pastor, this is Sunday night church. Everybody... It, are you? I can't assume that you know him. You can't assume that I know him. Do you know him? Salvation isn't a feeling, it's a fact. Again, salvation isn't knowing about him, it's knowing him. There was a song, I don't know how long ago, I think in the 50s. It was written, Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will abide till the end? Anybody heard that song before? Do you know him? John chapter 10, Jesus says this, I know my sheep and they know me. They hear my voice and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. Let's make sure tonight as we partake of the Lord's Supper that you and I examine, put ourselves on the examination table. And why are we taking these elements? Remember, if you take them unworthily, I believe that's, of course, you know, the, we've taught that before about what happens if you drink and, and, and partake unworthily. If you're not saved tonight, don't partake of the Lord's Supper. If there's doubt, don't partake. I don't want those things to come upon you. But I don't want you to leave here tonight without knowing for sure you're saved either. And so do you know? Let us examine ourselves and our Salvation. Number two, let us examine our sanctification. Again, many Christians get the fire insurance, but they live like, I don't know, they're just, you can't tell any, anything by their lifestyle. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Not only do I want to know him, Paul says, 
I want to be found in him. In verse number 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. He's already been there, done that, bought all the t-shirts. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. Amen? Sanctification, the righteousness of God. I wonder how often we take the time to examine ourselves and check to see just how holy it is we are living in the mere reflection of Him. I'm reminded of a story of a grocery store owner who overheard a young boy using the payphone at the entrance of the store. Converse, you know how conversation, telephone conversations are. You only hear one side of the conversation. The young boy was talking and the store manager was listening. Hello, sir. I was calling you to see if you could use a lawn boy to do your yard work. Oh, I see. You already have one. Well, is he doing the, the, your work to your satisfaction? He is. Thank you, sir. I was just checking. Then the young boy hung up the phone. The grocery store owner looked up at the boy and said, I'm so sorry you didn't get the job. Oh, no, sir, said the boy. I already have the job. I was just calling to check up on myself. <laughs> hey, why do we have to wait for God to humble us? When so much in the Bible it says, humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of God. Amen. Why do we have to wait for God to beat us and slap us up a little bit when we should be living holy every day? Striving for that sanctification, that part that God is wanting us to be. And by the way, again, not in the eyes of man, but in the eyes of God. How do you compare? To be found in Christ is salvation. But for Christ to be found in us is sanctification. Amen? To be found in Christ means God looks at me and he sees Christ. But to have Christ found in me means that when other people look at me, they see him. They know there's something different. When others view your life, can they see Jesus in you? There's another song that says, do I, do they see Jesus in me? Do I reflect who he is in all I say and do? This is the examination table of sanctification. Another story is told about a young girl who accepted Christ as her savior and applied for membership in a local church. Were you a sinner before you received the Lord Jesus into your life? Inquired the, the old deacon. Yes, sir. She replied, well, are you still a sinner? To tell you the truth, I feel I'm a greater sinner than ever. Then what real change have you experienced? I don't quite know how to explain it, she said, except I used to be a sinner running after sin, but now I'm saved. I'm a sinner running from sin. <laughs> Amen. It's a life of sanctification. Number three, let us examine our salvation to know him. Do you know him? To be found in him, that's sanctification. Number three, sincerity. Examine our sincerity, our genuineness. Look at verse number 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul was very sincere in waiting and wanting to know Christ in a very intimate way. Again, he didn't want just to know a little bit about Jesus. He didn't want to have a little talk with Jesus. He wanted to know a lot about Jesus. He wanted to have sweet hours of prayer with Jesus. When we are genuinely sincere to have that kind of relationship intimately with Christ, then we will place ourselves on the examination table and get ready for him to turn our apple cart over upside down. Let him slice where he will. I want to know, Paul says, the power of his resurrection. Well, what does that mean? Well, resurrection power is transformation. The resurrection points to the power of a life that has been transformed. When you and I truly desire to know the power of Christ's resurrection, we will be transformed. We will not be the same. It transformed Thomas. In John 20, 27, Jesus told Thomas, you remember the old doubting Thomas? 
After the resurrection, he said, Reach in thy finger, behold my hands, hither, reach hither thy hand, thrust it into my side. And Jesus said, Be not faithless, Thomas, but believing. No one ever doubted, or no, uh, Thomas never doubted after that. Why? He was transformed by the power of the resurrection. It also says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that Paul wanted to know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, being made conformable to his death. You know, that right there is, talk about sincerity. I want to know more about Christ's sufferings. I want to be partakers. I want to be made conformable to his death. You know, Job, the Old Testament saint there, Job, experienced great loss, did he not? God put him on the examination table. He allowed him to be put on the examination table. And you know, at the end of Job, at the, at the end of the book, Job said that I thought I knew him, but now I see him. Job 42.5. I thought I knew things about God, but now I see. What, what, what does he experience? He experienced the cross. He experienced Christ's sufferings. He experienced being made uh, conformable to his death. He was sincere. Finally, lastly, we must examine our surrender. Verse number 12, it says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. Notice the surrender here. I follow after the pursuit that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ, Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. This, listen, I'm, I'm following after. This one thing I do. He's dedicated. He's pursuing. He surrendered. He surrendered to forgetting those things which are behind him and reaching forth unto those things which are before him. And he surrendered, verse number 14, to press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The word attain means to arrive. The word apprehend means to possess. To follow after is a pursuit. And the pressing and the forgetting those things are behind are determination. This was Paul's desire to arrive and to possess a life that is following hard after Christ. No matter what. You know what we want today is we want to go and serve and be part of a church to where you're comfortable. You know, honestly, if I'm comfortable in the church, I'm not going to stay there too long. I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be ripped up by God's word. I want to be challenged every single time somebody opens up this word because I know my relationship isn't what it should be. Never want to be comfortable in Zion. Never want to hang up the harp. It means you're not going to be liked much. It means you're not going to have your own way. Paul had an all-consuming goal to get a hold of Christ as Christ got a hold of him. He was surrendered to whatever it took to gain the most noblest of prizes. What's that? Being called of God to reach a lost and dying world. And oh, how he did. He wasn't wrapped up in his own little what he wanted to do. He was surrendered to what God wanted him to do. And he reached the unknown world with the gospel. So where are you tonight as we partake here of the Lord's Supper in just a few minutes? Let us examine our salvation. Are you in Christ? Is he in you? Do you know my Jesus? Let us examine our sanctification. Are we set apart as we should to reflect Christ in our life to the lost and dying world? Or do they see us just like anybody else? Are we sincere? How is our sincerity? Are we real and genuine and ready to be made conformable unto his death? Are we really that true? And then let us examine our surrender. Are we willing and ready to do whatever it takes to live for him, to follow hard after him? As Paul says, I press toward the mark. There's a new press now. I used to press for the things there in verses 5 and 6, man. Those are the things I used to do. A lot of zeal. But now I'm pressing toward a different mark.
Amen. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. And by the way, he saw the light. Acts chapter 9. And it was a very shining light that blinded him. I think sometimes we need to go to the cross and get a little blindness. So that all we can focus on is him. I'll close with this. In 2009, many of you know, I, uh, I somehow or another contracted a abscess that nearly took my life. It had gone septic, septic. And um, by the time I went into the emergency room, an hour and 20 minutes later, I was on the operating room. Um, I was in the operating room, on the operating table, on the examination table. <laughs> and they were cutting into me to try to find out if they can get that infection out and to get my blood back to where it's supposed to be. Up until that point, I had been working multiple hours. I was running a full-time painting business, and I was pastoring a church. It was very busy days. And I took some time, because I was forced to. (laughs) I took some time looking up the hospital room, bed at the ceiling, all the things around it. And I'm like, why, God? Really? I'm doing the best I can to make things, you know. God gave us a cross experience. And six surgeries later, multiple weeks in the hospital, going home with a a compressed ball with a pick line in my neck, for about two months, taking vancomycin, antibiotic, strong antibiotic. I kept thinking, am I ever going to recover? <laughs> Today, 2022, I don't know how many years later that is, a lot. I still suffer with that. It's not completely healed. It still opens, it still drains. And I wonder, God, are you ever going to take this away from me? (laughs) And then I think of Paul. Paul had the thorn in the flesh, right? We're not quite sure what it was. But he asked God to take it away three times. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient. Lest you be exalted above measure. Maybe that's my problem. Maybe God doesn't want me to be exalted above measure. Maybe I'm prideful. But as I look at these four things tonight... And I see Paul's life reflecting back, saying, this is what I want to do. I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know him more than just salvation. I want to go on to be found in him. I want people to see Christ in me. I want to live a set-apart life so they can see that. I want to be real. I want to be sincere. And... God changed my life that day, I tell you that. But sometimes I want to go back and just, you know, you know, you leave it at the altar and you pick it back up. And I start to think of all the things again. Woe is me, woe is me. And God says, take it to the cross, right? Take it to the cross. Tonight as we look at the examination table that God has made for you and me. May we line up ourselves and examine those four things. Are we saved? Are we truly sanctified, set apart, doing what we're supposed to be doing? Are we surrendered? Are we sincere about serving God? Are we, meh, hit or miss the Bible, it's okay. Hit or miss soul winning, it's okay. Hit or miss, I don't know, my time with God, my devotion, it's okay. Hit or miss church, it's okay. That's not Paul's. He had a vehement desire to be totally surrendered. Do you? Father, thank you today for your word. Thank you tonight. It's challenging. It's convicting. Lord, I want to say with Paul that I may know you, the power of your resurrection, that I may be found in you. 
conformable, even unto death. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's what I desire. I know that's what many here desire tonight, too. I pray as we take a little bit of time tonight and just reflect on that as the, the men and I get ready to distribute this, these symbols of what you did on the cross for us. Let us examine ourselves as the admonition of 1 Corinthians is. And let us make sure that we are looking at these things tonight. Being found of him and being found in him and knowing him. And Lord, bless now the rest of this time, I pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have you remain seated as the piano and the organ plays. This is the invitation time. The men are going to be ready here in a few minutes. They're going to come up and be ready to serve. Let us examine ourselves right now before we partake. That's what it says. He says, let a man examine himself. So Paul begins to straighten out the Corinthians because they had uh, caused disorder and disunity in the Lord's Supper. And he says, I have received of the Lord that which I also del delivered unto you. This is the right way to do it. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me after the same Manner also took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We're going to have Brother Randy here. It's already been broken for you. We're going to have him give thanks for the, the bread here, the unleavened bread, which is a symbol of the body of our Savior. It's unleavened because there was no sin or corruption in him. Leaven is a symbol of sin, corruption. And so as we get ready to partake, there's, uh, these fellows are going to be handing it out. I'm going to have Randy thank the Lord for his, for his body. Heavenly Father, Lord, I never thank you enough for what you did. Mm. Yes.
ね。So we've taken time to examine ourselves. We've been given four areas that Paul was examining himself as he looked to Calvary. And as we look back tonight, we have this, again, this little unsavory, little unleavened, not really tasty, but uh, we are representing what Jesus did for us on the cross. And it wasn't a very savory time then either but what he did made all the difference in the world for us who believe and so it says and when he had given thanks which brother Randy did he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me and let's all partake together it says after the same manner he took the cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as the piano and the organ gets ready for the, the play, you get ready as we get the men to distribute the, the cup.
right? And it says, um, after the same manner. So he bra uh, break the bread, he gave thanks. And also we're going to give thanks now for the cup. This cup is the New Testament in my body. And he says, as this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembering the precious blood of Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, how precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Layman if he would pray for the precious blood of Jesus tonight. Father, we thank you so much for what you did for us. Mm. And I do believe it. Mm. And I know how, how you, you did it for us. You put that punishment for us. That blood is applied. Our sins are gone. Mm. As far as east is from the west. Mm. Thank you for your blood. Help us to never forget. Amen. cross at the cross at the cross where i first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith i received my sight Again, after the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. 
This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And let's partake together. If you could, pass your cups here to the center aisle. The men would come and collect them. And uh, Brother Tyler, you can come on up here and close us with some announcements. Thank you. Amen. All right. Get a few announcements for you. <clears throat> the Chosen Sunday School class is having a cookout, bonfire, and games at the Nussbaum's home. This is on Tuesday at 6 p.m., so that'll be a fun evening for them. Uh, secondly, there's a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center for food items needed for the Labor Day Fellowship on Monday, September 5th. So if you can uh, be a part of that and help out with that, please sign up on that sheet and let us know what you can bring. Uh, thirdly, there's a meeting for the Sunday School Teachers and Assistants on Thursday. Uh, that's at 6.30 p.m. before the service there. And then starting Thursday, September 1st, the Thursday and evening services will be permanently changed to 6 p.m. With this change, choir practices will begin to meet at 5 p.m. So that's all I have for announcements. Let's all stand. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us on the cross. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to continue to meditate and think about that. And Lord, help us to never get over that. Think about it every day, what, you do, what you've done for us, Lord, and how indebted we are to you. We thank you for your love for us. Help us to have a great week. Help us as we go out. Help us to be a... Uh, blessing to those that were around this week. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, hold on a minute before I dismiss you. Sit down for a minute so I can see your hands raised. I've gotten a little bit of flack from our service time change. First of all, I want to let you know that I never want to railroad anything through just because I want to do it. Um, I was under the impression the other night when people raised their hand that the majority of the crowd was those who would like to start our evening services at 6 p.m., However, I've been approached by some good people with some good reasons, and here's what I want to do tonight. Those of you who never raise your hand for anything, all right, go ahead and leave. <laughs> Seriously, because it doesn't help me right now, okay? So I want a raise of hands. This is for the adults. Kids, you don't get a, cho you don't get a choice, all right? And uh, unless you're 18 and above, all right, I'll let you have a voice. But... Uh, if you are 18 and above and you are a member here of this church and you are faithful to this church and this is your church, you call your church, I would like to know that this is just on Thursday night and possibly even on Friday night, okay? Because I've even had some flack, not flack, but uh, security team members are having a hard time getting here at that time. So if I kept the time at 6 o'clock on Sunday, which I don't think that would affect anybody, most of us are off on Sunday, all right? So if we just kept the 6 o'clock hour on Sunday and then maybe uh, or moved the Sunday night hour to 6 o'clock but kept the Thursday night and the Friday night at 7 p.m., okay? So let's do one at a time. How many of you are okay for Sunday night at 6 o'clock? Raise your hand. You're okay to stay at 6 o'clock? Raise your hand. Okay. If you are not okay, it's okay to be different here. If you are not okay with six o'clock, raise your hand. Okay, all right. Um, all right, the other thing is Thursday night. If you are okay, if you are okay with six o'clock, the hour change on Thursday night, raise your hand. If you are okay, keep your hand up. Please keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Okay, you are okay. Okay, all right. If you are not okay and you want to go back or you want to stay at 7 p.m. on Thursday night, raise your hand. Wow, okay. All right. And uh, those of you in HOPE program, all right, if you are okay with 6 o'clock, raise your hand. If you are not okay with six o'clock and you'd rather keep it at seven o'clock in the HOPE program, raise your hand. Okay. All right, I'm gonna think about it and I'm gonna pray about it, but um, that has changed from the other night, just to let you know. So I don't know what y'all were on the other night or whether you didn't listen to me when I gave the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
you know, the announcement there. But anyway, um, I will consider, and I, I, I've only did it for two reasons. I did it because y'all were here, and it seemed like it, it was a good hour to just, you know, for the revival service all of every night, y'all were here. And you're like, yeah, you don't know what I got, did to get here, right? But I also did it for the sake of school and children because a lot of y'all have children that come to school, and I wanted to give you a little bit more time in the evening for your families uh, to get ready for school and not to be so tired getting up the next day. Amen? That's why I did it. I just wanted you to know the motive behind my madness. All right? All right, you may stand. And you are dismissed. God bless you.